Good day. We start another week with yet another uh, programme about the global crisis which now is arranging itself, as I've said many times, over the conflict in Ukraine. And over the last couple of hours, days, we've now seen a major up increase in the level of the fighting again. And there seems to be intense fighting around the town of Bakhmut in uh, northern Donetsk region and also against around the town of Siversk in northern Donetsk region. I'm not going to say go into the details of the fighting. The Russians claim to have captured various settlements. The uh, expression that's always used by military people is that the Russians are shaping the battlefield. They seem to be um, shelling very heavily uh, Ukrainian troops in this area. They seem to be attacking warehouses where they claim that ammunition for um, um, Western-supplied uh, artillery guns provided to Ukraine uh, was destroyed. They also, by the way, claim to have destroyed another warehouse where there were missiles for the HIMARS systems also supplied by the United States. But anyway, in total and in summary, the fact is that there is a great deal more fighting. The Russians are again gaining ground. They're gaining control of more settlements. They seem to be shaping the battlefield. Incidentally, the Financial Times now says that the commander of the, uh, uh, the overall commander of Russian forces in eastern Ukraine. In Ukraine is General Zhidko, Colonel General Zhidko. A few, uh, a short time ago, uh, the British Ministry of Defense saying it was General Surovikin in re replacing General Dvornikov. I've always been a bit suspicious about General Surovikin's appointment. Um, and apparently I've read elsewhere that another um, agency claimed that General Zhidko was actually appointed to take over from General Dvornikov back in May. It all seems very confusing to me. I'm not sure how important any of this is, but it does seem astonishing that we don't yet have a clear explanation in the West of what the Russian military hierarchy is in Ukraine. I'm assuming, as I've said many times, that the Pentagon at least knows. Um, but it does seem strange that this in information is being held, withheld from us here in the West. Anyway, there we are. Um, I'm not going to get into de a discussion about that. I will say, as I said, that the war seems to be going on, progressing in very much the same way as it did before. It's that same progression that I've talked about in the past. The Russians build up their artillery, they shell heavily the battlefield, they degrade the U Ukrainian defences. Only once the Ukrainian defences are degraded, only then do they advance, and then towns, settlements, cities fall very fast. And before they attack the main settlements, in this case Bakhmut and Siversk, they make sure that the Towns and villages around the, these two main centres, Bakhmut and Siversk, have been captured, isolating these towns, these big, these bigger towns, uh, in this case Bakhmut and Siversk, so that when the moment comes to launch the infantry to attack them, they are captured fast. Now, I'm going to return to the topic of the HIMARS systems because there's been some... Um, confusion about this. Um, in my least last programme, I said that there were reports attributed to the Financial Times that the United States has decided to provide um, a 300 kilometre uh, range missiles together with the additional four HIMARS systems that are being supplied to Ukraine. Now, this was an attribution to the Financial Times. I said that I could not, I'd looked through the Financial Times, I could not find anywhere any reference to this claim that these longer-range HIMARS missiles were being supplied by the United States. And a number of other people have done the same. They've also 
gone through, they've pieced through the Financial Times, and they too cannot find any reference to these longer range high mass systems being supplied to Ukraine in the Financial Times, just as I could not. And this has caused some people to question the entire story, to say that they don't think that the United States is in fact supplying high mass systems, long range, 300 kilometre uh, range, uh, high mass missile systems to Ukraine. And in fact, it seems as if that story did originate from various Ukrainian sources, various Ukrainian blogs and such places. Well, I would ask people not to rush to conclusions about this. In my last programme, I said why it made sense to me for the United States to start supplying longer range uh, missiles of this nature to Ukraine. Um, I still maintain the view that the Russians are probably telling the truth when they say that two of these high mass systems have been destroyed. And of course, the United States announced the supply of four more high mass systems. And as I said, I think it is likely that the reason these additional high mass systems are being supplied to Ukraine is to some extent to make up for the loss of the two which the Russians claim were destroyed. Now, I also said in that program that it seemed to me that if it was indeed the case that these high mass systems had been destroyed and if they had been destroyed close to the front lines, then it would be logical to supply more long-range missiles for the high mass systems to get them away from the front line where the Russians find it easier to destroy them so that they can be launched against targets in the uh, 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 behind the Russian lines from further away, from fur, uh, more out of reach of Russian artillery formations. So I think that it's highly likely that those Ukrainian bloggers were telling the truth, those Ukrainian sources were telling the truth, and more of these long-range missiles have indeed been supplied. And I'm going to also say that um, I think that it was a mistake to attribute this story to the Financial Times because nothing like that um, appears in the Financial Times. But if you read US statements, they do seem to be talking about supplying Ukraine with long range, high precision systems. And it does seem to me most plausible that these are these high Mars missiles. Now, this is not obviously a conclusive, we don't know this for a fact, this is all based on supposition, but I think that is probably what is happening. So anyway, let's wait and see. What I will say is this, the Russians have um, noticed that Ukraine has been using the high Mars systems, and they do say that some of the Ukrainian missile attacks have become more precise and that they are causing some problems. I don't get the sense that the Russians are in any kind of panic about this. I read an extraordinary article in the Daily Telegraph saying that the Russians are now experiencing a uh, um, ammunition hunger, that they're running out of ammunition. How often have we heard that story? Um, and supposedly this is because multiple warehouses, Russian warehouses and ammunition depots have been destroyed by HIMARS systems. Well, that is certainly not the case, but certainly there's been some missile strikes by Ukraine, by the Ukrainians, well behind Russian front lines. And interestingly, the main area of focus seems to be the area behind Donetsk city. Perhaps that is where the Ukrainians believe the Russians have their biggest ammunition depots. Perhaps that is where the Russians have their biggest ammunition depots. There was an attack on a warehouse at a place called Shakhtyorsk, and it's been suggested that this was, in fact, a, an important ammunition depot. Well, look, we're going to have to see, but I'm 
pretty certain that the Russians will be studying the operation of the HIMARS very carefully. They'll be, as I said, taking steps to track down and destroy these HIMARS systems wherever they can. There's been, as I said, already reports that they've destroyed a warehouse. The Russians with their long-range uh, missile strikes have destroyed a warehouse which contained these, uh, uh, which was housing uh, uh, HIMARS missiles intended for HIMARS launchers. My own suspicion, and I've said this previously, and already there's been some reports to this, is that the major way that the Russians will counter that, the HIMARS systems is that once they've understood fully the trajectory of these missiles, worked out how they operate, that their um, anti-missile anti and anti-aircraft systems, which are extremely effective, will be tasked with intercepting them. And I suspect that before very long, we're going to st start to see the effectiveness of these systems degrade. That has been the consistent pattern throughout the war, that they start with a certain appearance of effectiveness, the Russians then work out how they work, and then they find means to counter them. And that has been the pattern throughout the war. Overall, as I said, whatever these HIMARS systems are doing, it's not making a major impact on the battlefields. On the battlefields, the Ukrainians are still retreating, they're still losing, they're still losing towns and settlements in eastern, Do in eastern Ukraine, in northern Donetsk region. The Russians are getting ever closer to Bakhmut and Siversk, and they're acting as if they're preparing to encircle, or at least to cut off the main roads to these two places, um, preparing them for the point where they will eventually fall. So that, it seems to me, remains the course of this battle. Now, there has been something else. The Ukrainians have again been talking up the story about the great counteroffensive that they're going to launch in Kherson region. And there's been a whole flood of Ukrainian claims about this million-man army Ukraine is building up in its rear, how it's going to be re-equipped with Western weapons, and how it is going to launch a general offensive on Kherson region. And I'm afraid I'm deeply sceptical about these claims, One, uh, which, by the way, were reported without um, comment or apparent scepticism in the London Times. I'm very sceptical about these stories, and I'm afraid I um, go along with the Russian view that all these claims about this million-man army and the great advance on Kherson are intended to unnerve people in Kherson who, are, who might be thinking about voting in a referendum to join Russia, which the Russians seem to be planning for this particular region. I, I think, in other words, it's a, an attempt by Ukraine to say, to warn people in Kherson region, we'll be back, don't uh, work with the Russians if you do, you may face consequences once we return. And in any event, if your inclinations are to support us, don't be intimidated or persuaded by the Russians to go along with their governments, their, their, their referendums, the things that they're trying to set up in Kherson region. In, stay with us because sooner or later, perhaps later rather than sooner, our million-man army will be on its way to rescue you. Well, psychological warfare is part of war. I'm not particularly um, surprised by this, nor do I think it particularly wrong. Now, I will say that the Russians, for their part, are now uh, complaining that the Ukrainians are forcibly evacuating people from um, Donetsk, uh, from, from the city, from various cities in Donetsk, including Slavyansk, Kramatorsk, Bakhmut, and uh, Solidar, and uh, Siversk. And by the way, the Russians are also claiming 
that Ukrainian troops are pulling out of Siversk and are being redirected south towards the defense of Bakhmut, which is supposedly the more important place. Well, I'm going to say this, say this too. And again, some people may not be pleased with what I'm going to say, which is that the Russians are always claiming that the Ukrainians uh, um, keep civilians in cities and then use them as human shields, which I agree is very wrong. But now the Russians are complaining that the Ukrainians are evacuating these people from these cities, which means, of course, presumably that they can't be used human shields. Again, as human shields. Now, that seems to me to be right. Now, you know, it's for the Russians to decide which, so which story they want to run. But it seems to me that they can't run with both at the same time. Either the Ukrainians are forcing the local people to stay in the cities so that they can be used as human shields or they are not and you have to make a decision which of the two it is anyway there we are that's what i'm going to say about the situation in ukraine what i will also say however is that there is growing feeling apparently across the west that this campaign to support ukraine is running into problems. Now, a short time ago, I uh, read through an article. I, I informed everybody, uh, all of you, about an article which had appeared in, uh, which had been published uh, by the Royal United Services Institute about the inability of uh, the West to keep Ukraine supplied with ammunition in anything like the levels that Ukraine is expending, that the uh, Ukraine is not only massively outgunned, but it is massively outgunned uh, uh, um, by, um, not just by Russia, but that the West cannot supply the ammunition, uh, doesn't produce enough ammunition to keep uh, Ukraine supplied to the extent that it needs to sustain the war. And this has now been this has now reached mainstream media in the West. So the Financial Times has an article, Military Briefing, is the West running out of ammunition to supply Ukraine? And um, the um, article then goes on to say, the Ukraine war has exposed the skimpiness of Western defence stockpiles, especially of unglamorous but crucial supplies such as artillery shells that have been the mainstay of fighting. Lack of production capacity, labour shortages and supply chains snafus, especially computer chi chips, mean long lead times to replenish them. And the shortages defence officials and analysts say reveal the West's complacency about potential threats since the end of the Cold War, now shown up by the desire to show, shore up Ukraine with military support. Fetishes for high-tech weaponry and lean manufacturing have obscured the importance of maintaining stockpiles of basic kit. So that's how the Financial Times reports it, and in fact, it tries to put a much more positive spin on the story, as you might expect, than what I suspect is the much more factual and objective and ultimately much more concerning or alarming Rusi, Royal United Services Institute article. But it is clear that the West is struggling to keep up with Ukraine's needs for artillery, ammunition and such like. It's going to find it increasingly difficult to keep Ukraine supplied with all of these weapons. And that was published by the United, Royal United Services Institute, but now even the Financial Times is starting to publish articles that concede this. And in the meantime, uh, we are also getting more and more of a sense that August is going to be the decisive month unless Ukraine and the Western powers 
stabilise the situation in August if the war does indeed drag on into the autumn and the winter then one begins to get a sense that even the Western powers worry that they may not be able to sustain Ukraine's war effort for very much longer. Indeed, there has been a number of reports which say that it would be extremely difficult for the United States to put together another $40 billion package like the one we saw a few weeks ago. As I discussed when we, I went through that package previously, that $40 billion package, in fact, only covered, to a small extent, Ukraine's specific needs. Most of it was committed, was money committed to replenishing the West's own depleting stockpiles. Um, apparently, for both financial and industrial reasons, it may be in all but impossible to repeat the same uh, package all over again. Anyway, we shall see. Now, that brings me to perhaps the biggest story, because today Nord Stream 1 is being closed for basic repair, for necessary repair. And of course, the big unanswered question is, will the Russians reopen Nord Stream 1 when its repairs are ended? And across Europe, there is now, a, you can almost sense it, an intake of breath. And perhaps because of the worry that the Russians will not reopen Nord Stream 1, the Canadians have now decided to row back their sanctions and they've agreed to supply the turbine that the Russians said they needed to get Nord Stream 1 back and running and that uh, this turbine is going to be supplied by Canada to, the, to Siemens, this German company, uh, repaired presumably, and will then be forwarded to the Russians so that Nord Stream 1 can back get back into operation and um, gas prices natural gas prices have been rising and now there is general fear about what happens if the Russians completely switch Nord Stream 1 off I'm going to make my own guess I think that the Russians once the repairs are done will switch Nord Stream 1 back on but I think that they're also going to reduce their supplies of gas to Europe and I think they're going to do this in the way that they've been doing up to now gradually dialing down the gas they produce thereby keeping the Europeans on edge until eventually we get to the winter the reserves are far from filled gas reserves in Europe are far from filled and an energy crunch will hit, will start to hit. And if the Russians do intend to close off the gas entirely, perhaps midwinter is more likely the time that they will do it. Um, we shall see. But there's no doubt at all that this is creating more and more problems. There's increasingly bleak articles appearing. There was an article on Zero Hedge about Germany quietly shutting down amid fears of social unrest. And one reads articles in places like the Daily Telegraph in Britain about how Britain is falling apart. That was in the Daily Telegraph and that's about Britain. Now Britain pretends that it doesn't import gas directly from Russia, but as we've seen, the reality is that it is fully integrated within the uh, Western, um, the, the, the European gas system, which is ultimately dependent on Russia. So it seems to me that the economic war is going to drag on. I don't see that it's in the Russian interests just to go for a killing blow. I think if they did that, I think they would lose leverage. It's always better to keep something, hold something back, keep some gas running, 
so that you can always keep people worried that you might cut it off, then simply cut it off, at which point people start looking for alternatives or, or, or psychologically prepare for that reality. It's always better to play these things long and that way to win. And of course, that if that's indeed what the game the Russians are playing, if they're going to keep us all cold in the winter here in Europe, well, isn't there that old expression, revenge is a dish to be eaten cold? Perhaps in winter it will get very cold in Europe indeed. Well, I hope not. I hope something is achieved or agreed before then. Apparently, Chancellor Schroeder is talking, uh, former Chancellor Schroeder is resurfacing. And one wonders whether he's positioning himself to be the person to come and talk to the Russians. Well, we will see. But one way or the other, the situation in Europe is not looking good. And in the meantime, elsewhere in the world, things, of course, are also very hard. But no less a person than Josep Borrell, the um, European High uh, Representative for Foreign Policy, the EU's Foreign Minister, if you like, has now admitted following the G20 summit meeting that the Russians have been winning the narrative war across the global south. Most people in the global south, most countries in the global south, are remaining neutral in this affair, which, as they of course know, means that essentially they're siding with Russia. Well, we shall see what happens. I suspect that over the next few weeks, we have about two weeks of heavy, heavy shelling in Ukraine, as we've seen so many times before, before the Russians finally make their move against Bakhmut and Siversk. And once those fall, sometime around the end of July, the ground will be paved for the further advance on Slavyansk and Kramatorsk, bringing the battle to in Donbass to its culminating point. Now, as I said, if Donbass falls, as it, I suspect it will, over the course of August, if it falls entirely to the Russians, well, at that point, with winter coming, with autumn closing in and winter coming advancing further more quickly towards us well the ground will be prepared for a further major russian advance into central ukraine if that's indeed what the russians are planning to do anyway that's how the situation looks at the moment we'll see what happens both on the battlefronts and in what you might call the gas war. Thank you for joining me again today. Uh, remember, you can join us on other platforms, locals, our main alternative channel, but also Rumble, Odyssey, Super U, and you can also um, support us if you wish via Patreon and Subscribestar, and, um, and also by coming to our shop, buying the great things that you will find there. Um, our mugs, our hats, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts, our bomber jackets, and all the rest. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to press the like button and please check your subscription to this channel. Thank you for joining me again today and more from me soon.